Cloy Zeke Rogers, Zeke was his nickname, he was uh, an American Indian, and myself were asked to stay in Boston and daily walk to the MIT Radiation Lab in Cambridge, that's Massachusetts Institute of Technology, just across the Charles River. Uh, to, and we were to assist the professors there, Dr. Platt and Dr. Hilger and several others, as they were experimenting and designing a new radar system and equipment. Zeke and I worked with soldering irons and other tools, assembling and changing various equipment as we were instructed by the professors. And we did general other gopher duties. It was interesting duty, but I wasn't uh, quite aware of the overall technical details or objectives. Uh, our orders had said <clears throat> that I was to eventually accompany a plane from Bedford, and it didn't say any more than that. I had one weekend to pass to New York City while I was there. After eight weeks at uh, the MIT lab, Zeke and I were transferred to the Bedford airport and saw that the other ten mechanics had each assembled a specific radar set that was to be installed in an airplane. With their help and MIT technical support, Zeke and I each assembled a set too. Mine was installed in a B-17, some were installed in B-24s. The plan was for one plane to leave each week. I was the second to leave, but unknown to me, the first plane, which was a B-24, was stalled in Belize for engine repairs for two months, of course. <laughs> so I was the first of our little group to arrive at our destination. <clears throat> well, back in Bedford on December 4th, uh, a B-17 number 1166, which was later named Johnny Walker V, which was named after the ferry uh, crew pilot, that left Bedford with me and a ferry crew and, of course, my radar set. My informal instructions were to stay with the set, and that's about all I had. I had no written orders, but apparently the pilot did that, uh, that carried me through. Every place I came to, they always seemed to be expecting me. I had assumed we were going to England, but nothing official. We stopped overnight at an air transport uh, command base in, in Maryland, and arrived at Langley Field, Virginia on December 5th. I had several briefings there, was issued new clothing, fur flying suit, boots, a carbine, no ammunition, everything I needed for overseas. Stayed there five days, spent most of the time in the library because it's a highly restricted area. And I left Langley Field on December 10th. And, and keep in mind all the time, I'm just a passenger on this thing with my radar set. And we stopped for an hour in Grenier, New Hampshire, then on to Presque Isle, Maine, which is our port of embarkation. Stayed there two days for engine maintenance. In Presque Isle, it was discovered that I had not received my overseas shots, so they gave me all five shots at one time. I shook all night from that, but I was okay after another day. We left Presque Isle <clears throat> December 12th and landed in Goose Bay, Labrador, four hours later. Keep in mind, this is the middle of December. This is a cold place up there. Stayed in Goose Bay five days, held up by weather. I took my turn and slept guard on the plane one night to sign for overwater supplies being unloaded. It was very cold, maybe 10 below. When my relief came at 6 a.m., I was so stiff I could hardly walk from the remote parking spot. About a breakfast fixed me up on that. We left Goose Bay December 17th at, uh, at 2 a.m. for Iceland, a seven-hour trip. We left that early to take advantage of the short daylight at that uh, latitude so we be sure and find Iceland. We left Iceland about noon the next day after a huge de-icing detail. We left for Scotland. I was asked to de-ice the tail section with a mop and bucket of de-icing fluid. I'd never been on any kind of an airplane crew before, I was just a passenger. So they got me up on the tail and mopped the thing down, and when I was done they said, come on, jump down, we'll catch you. And that was a long way down to me sitting up on the tail up there, and I said, 
if I dropped down and I broke a leg or something, I couldn't stay with this set, and that's my order, stay with the set. So I insisted they bring a ladder, and they did. And they got a lot of razzing about that. And we finally <clears throat> were able to take off, and we arrived in Prestwick, Scotland, late in the afternoon of December 18th. And I waited around there seven days for further orders. No passes, nothing, just sitting waiting. This is a big mystery trip I was on here. Well, we left Pester, uh, Prestwick uh, December 24th, that's Christmas Eve, with my plane and radar and landed at the Air Force Base at Elkenbury, England. Two and a half hours later, I was assigned to the 18, 813th Bomb Squadron, 382nd Bomb Group. That, I think that's where the uh, ferry group, uh, ferry uh, crew left the plane and then the 8th Air Force took over and the plane mistakenly they flew it off the next morning without me and they flew to an air RAF base uh, near Great Malvern in the western hills of England so on by December 30th they figured out they had to do something with me so they gave me some train tickets and money for rations and quarters for a month and put me on a train at 7 o'clock in the morning, told me how to change stations in London and get to Great Malvern to a hotel there, I forget the name of the hotel, where someone would meet me. This is quite a mysterious trip. It was 8 p.m. when I got there and pitch dark. A cabbie nudged me and asked me, where are you going, lad? And so I told him about the hotel and he found it for me, which I couldn't see because of the blackout curtain. But I got inside with my duffel bag and several of the professors from MIT met me. The professors I'd worked with uh, back in Boston. After dinner, they took me to a pub where he knew several GIs would be, of course. Who, they were gonna leave pretty soon and I was to stay in their place. And the place I stayed was Mrs. McLeod's Room and Board. It was a nice place, breakfast and supper by the fireplace because it was warmer there. No other heat in the building. This is just like a bed and breakfast you'd find here. And so I stayed there, well, I was there two months. <clears throat> I reported the next day to TRE, which is Technical Research and Engineering. It's like the MIT of the U.S. That's their, their technical university. And I did the same kind of work I did at MIT in Boston with the same professors from MIT. They had come over, plus some other British people. The London Symphony, incidentally, played several uh, times while in Great Ma Malvern, and I enjoyed that, being a former musician. I also managed to get to several parties in English homes with the people from the lab where I worked. I was there three months. As the other 11 uh, radar mechanics came one by one, a week apart, to an Air Force base, tuning up their equipment and whatever they had to do there. It was decided finally that our new radar equipment should be transferred to the 9th Air Force B-26s, which had just been moved up from Africa. And our radar equipment was transferred to a base near Great Sailing, about 60 miles northeast of London. The last week of March, while I was still out in Great Malvern, I accompanied a 6x6 truck full of electronic equipment uh, gear from Great Malvern to Great Sailing. It was an all-day trip, arriving about 8 p.m. Equipment was put under guard, and I joined the other 11 radar mechanics that I had last seen at, uh, in the Bedford, Maine in mid-December. A maintenance shop was set up, and the first Pathfinder Squadron provisional was just starting to form. Three radar mechanics uh, maintenance chiefs who had trained with the RAF in Canada were added to our crew, and B-26s and their crews were brought in from existing squadrons. The way our squadron was made up was took one plane and one crew from each of a number of squadrons, and they got their pay and all the other accommodations from their own squadrons, and we were a provisional group just pulled together from all these people borrowed from other units. Uh, our uh, uh, Lieutenant Howard Lindsay was assigned to head up our little radar group, and our CO was a fighter pilot who had uh, just completed 50 missions in Alaska. Well, 
uh, oversimplified. Our new radar gear was an electronic bomb sight based on techniques and frequencies the enemy had not yet developed, and so it was free from jamming by the enemy. The British handled the ground-based equipment, and the Americans the B-20 in B-26s did the airborne part. When specific targets were identified, and the ground base was able to plot them on a scope and direct the B-26 Pathfinder with coded signals while watching him also on the same scope to the target, even over 10 tenths clouds cover, and tell him when to open the bay doors and tell him when to drop. A group of other squadrons would be following this Pathfinder and drop at the same time. We received a presidential citation for getting direct hits on several coastal guns from 10,000 feet over 10 tenths clouds on D-Day. There were no radar operators on the planes. The bombardier merely turned its head on and positioned the antenna sometime after takeoff, and he and the pilot listened for their instructions. I flew on several test flights, but never on a mission. Our job was to daily test while on the ground uh, and maintain the equipment and to make final adjustments just prior to takeoff for each specific mission. We were pretty much on constant uh, availability and as such we did not uh, pull any other duties. It was our understanding that we were formed by a presidential letter for the sake of secrecy and thus did not appear to exist. Of course this made it difficult for any promotions, payroll, a lot of things. I was finally promoted to staff sergeant in February of 1945, 14 months after arriving overseas. We were eventually attached to the 322nd Bomb Group, which helped some. Some questioned our being called the Pathfinder Squadron, but it seems so many other squadrons are nicknaming themselves Pathfinders that it appeared not to be a problem. I presume there were also visual pathfinders in some groups. Many missions were flown while we were in England. Our pathfinder and a deputy pathfinder would fly off and rendezvous with the group somewhere and lead them to a target. One problem was our ground equipment could not detect a flak field and would sometimes send the pathfinder right into it. The group following him might or might not follow sometimes leaving him out there alone. Our little group was able to repair the damaged sets because we built them in the first place, even though we didn't know that much about the theory. I now marvel at the way this project was set up to accomplish its goals and still maintain the secrecy required. I never saw any of the, <clears throat> the uh, British equipment uh, that the RAF was running, and I never saw any RAF people come around uh, our place either. But somewhere along the line this was coordinated and I presume through the professors. Later we received some commercially made radar sets to, uh, for replacements for those that didn't return. And in the set there was an explosive uh, device that would go off on impact or it could be set off manually if necessary. On the afternoon of June 5th, 1944, day before D-Day, I was instructed to go with one of our pathfinders to another base to make the last minute adjustments. This was apparently to reduce rendezvous time and congestion for a very busy night and day. I made my adjustments about 10 p.m. and learned about 3 a.m. June 6 that the invasion had started. I don't know where or when my plane went, but it came back, and I returned to my base the next day. That was a very exciting night as we listened to the radio news reports of the invasion. While in great sailing, uh, that's in England, I had passes to London, Chelmsford, Raintree, and Colchester. I heard and saw numerous buzz bombs and much damage. We were on the same base as the 322nd Bomb Group. Now for the fun part. On this base, the 322nd Bomb Group, there was a 9th Air Force 17-piece dance band. This is why I started off the way I did. Called the Skyliners. All enlisted men, former musicians, but now combat crewmen and flight support with
with the exception of the band leader who was with special services. When Zeke and I were back in Boston at MIT, we often shared our experiences as former musicians. He arrived at Great Sailing before I came over from Great Malvern and had started to play guitar with the Skyliners. The second evening after I arrived in Great Sailing, Zeke invited me to come over and listen to a rehearsal. It was a great band playing all the Glenn Miller arrangements and Benny Goodman and Les Brown, all of them. It just, that was super music back then. He asked me to sit in. I declined. I hadn't played for a year and I had no horn. He said, well, we do, and brought out a new trombone that I later learned all the guys in the band had taken up a collection to buy. And for the next nine months, in addition to my radar duties, I played with the Skyliners for dances on the base. We went to other bases in the nearby towns and villages for a local population, in our hospitals, out in the tarmac when they were flying two or three missions a day, and even for Red Cross dances in London and Paris. It was a morale booster for the listener and the players, and it added a real plus to my military experience, and I enjoyed it. It took the stress off my regular duties. I still keep in touch with Zeke. In late September, uh, the 322nd group moved to France, and the Pathfinders went with them. The radar group drove, and I was in a test van, to Southampton and onto an LST with many other vehicles and set off for France. On September 25th, we drove off the LST into the water onto the beach at Normandy, through the sand and up the hill to a restored road and in convoy on a one-way road to an airfield near Beauvais, about 50 miles north of Paris. Unfortunately, the British test van I was in was hit head-on by an emergency vehicle bucking the one-way traffic. No one was hurt, but we had a broken axle. We were shoved into an orchard, given a case of K-rations, and told to wait with our truck for the equipment and help. And the convoy went on. There was about, I think, maybe 50 vans in the convoy. We slept in the test test van that night, and about six o'clock in the morning there was a rap on the door. It was a Frenchman with coffee cognac. This is a new experience for two 24-year-olds. We thanked him as best we could. Uh, help came that day, and we were hauled away to a repair depot, and finally left on October 1st. While driving over to Beauvais, just my buddy and myself in this one van, we stopped for a key ration snack in a little French village. We had two five-gallon jerry cans of gas strapped on the back of the van, and one of the villagers came up and told us we had a leak in one of the cans. They thought we were British because we had been issued British-style jackets, and we were in British van, and they wanted to trade some eggs for cans of sardines, which the British soldiers carried for their rations. They just carried cans of sardines. I was surprised at that. So we finally ended up trading the jerry can of gas for 10 fresh eggs. And <clears throat> they needed the gas to run the pump on the town well, which the town was in terrible shape. And he said they wanted to get this well going. And so we thought it was a fair trade, a good deed to boot, and we got 10 fresh eggs. Well, we got to the base at the Beauvais about 10 o'clock that night. And those that still up went down to the, uh, to the shack, and we celebrated our arrival by having 10 fried fresh eggs, which we hadn't had for months. That was a big deal for us. At Bovey, we stayed in six-man pyramidal tents, and the runways were in bad shape. This is a former German uh, runway. <clears throat> the Battle of the Bulge occurred while we were there, and we were very busy with pathfinding routines so busy that the last time I played with the Skyliners was New Year's Eve, 1944. A week later, on January 7th, the Pathfinder Squadron moved on to another former German airstrip at Monchi Lagach, near San Quentin, on the same field as the 397th bomb group. We lived in the attic of a large house in town, and the pathfinding business increased, I believe due to more troop support activity. We were getting closer to the front lines and a lot of troop support. 
It was here that a B-26 with a runaway prop crash landed on my test vehicle, which I had left just a minute before, completely demolishing it. It was in the parking lot. I got a replacement truck and, and new test gear in a few days, but the replacement tools were nearly as, as good as I'd started out with. As another little side, Zeke and I joined up with two officers from the 397th for a four-piece band that played for a, a few officer dances on the base. We had fun with that. The first week of April, we moved up to Venlo, Holland. Again, much closer behind the line. Again with the 397th and also the 394th Bond Group. The E Day happened a few weeks later, so there wasn't excessive activity there. But by this time, the radar section of the Pathfire Squadron was very much organized and operations were going smoothly. But even yet, there was no tech order, which seemed to irritate everyone because they still had problems getting paid and any kind of promotions. The Pathfinder Squadron broke up about May 17th. I was transferred to the 574th Bomb Squadron and 391st Bomb Group in Ash, Belgium. Stayed there for a week. Then the 391st moved to Vitry, France. That's near Lille. We were alerted to go to the Pacific. I learned the Sharon and Lorraine radar systems. Some of you must have had those on your, some of your planes. I learned the maintenance for them and was transferred to the 572nd Squadron. We went to Camp Chicago to prepare for movement to the Pacific. Then VJ Day happened and our orders were changed and we were to go home. In mid-August, I had an enjoyable seven-day uh, furlough in Switzerland, right? We were waiting to go to, to the east. After many delays, we came to the Calais staging area near Marseille on September 25th. Because the Pathfinder squadron was provisional, we weren't really an outfit. I had only received four battle stars and said it only had had 76 points. Not enough. And so this 570s second left, and I was transferred to a replacement depot. And from there to the 343rd Harbor Craft Company on the 23rd of October. And then we waited to come home. And I left Marseille for the U.S. late in November of 45 on a Liberty ship. In about 10 days, arrived in Newport News, New York, or I guess that's in Virginia. Took a trip. Tr uh, troop ship, uh, troop train to Camp McCoy and was discharged December 15th and took the train back home to Minneapolis. Quite an experience for this young guy with no basic training. <laughs>